Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? It's Fiona McDavid here. Um, I'm going to talk tonight for uh, about breast cancer and give you some information about it in, in relation to exercise and how it can help and all the benefits. And this is part of our Lymph Balance Centre Summer Speaker Series. So I hope you're enjoying it so far. So I'm a physiotherapist for about 28 years. I'm also a certified lymphedema therapist and I'm an advanced craniosacral therapist. And this broad set of tools in my toolbox really helps me to help my patients, which I really enjoy. So just to say also about if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to put them into the chat and I'll go through those afterwards and check them then. OK, so breast cancer surgery and its effects. So what is affected by surgery? Well, obvious things like your range of motion of some of your joints, of your shoulder joint, sometimes your neck, your, your rib cage and upper torso, your function, what we call ADL, which is activities of daily living. And they're your regular things like brushing your hair, tying your brass strap type of thing, um, your sport and exercise, whatever that is for you, fun hobbies, and obviously important things like playing with your children or with your animals, energy, mood, um, and sorry, skipped one too quickly, and sleep. So um, the other thing is how does that affect you? So it can cause pain, obviously, because this is surgery. So they have cut into your skin and your muscles and the fascia and so on. It can cause an irritation of different it, issues as well and um, a lot of people would say that they get fatigued from it and that's quite a common uh, symptom. Sleep is affected which will obviously affect your mood and you get a decreased interest in your play or your fun or your sport that type of thing and also a decrease in the ability to perform daily tasks. So causes of the shoulder movement dysfunction. As a physio, this is what interests me particularly and how I can help your, you, the patients. The usual suspects are the surgery, the wound, obviously, chemotherapy, because it's different chemicals and they can create a tension in the fascia and uh, create um, almost like a knot sometimes. Radiation is a big piece because it dries out the tissue and things that are dry, they don't move as smoothly and glide over each other quite so easily. Anesthetic is another part that some people don't think about, but an anesthetic is quite a big thing. It's like, a you know, resetting your whole computer. So um, everything gets switched off and has to be switched on again. And sometimes some parts are a bit slower than others. And it, it, some anesthetic um, doctors would say it could take up to a year to get the anesthetic completely out of your system. It's improving all the time. And another part is emotional. The fear response particularly, anything that triggers our fear response, we tend to fix and curl in into that fetal position, self-protection. And then when we've had surgery here up and around our breast area, that will also trigger it in that area too. So there's a few reasons why we'd be curling in and creating the tension and tightness at the front and stretching it at the back. So all of these will affect different parts of the body. We mentioned the skin already, the scar tissue that that will create was it's trying to be part of the healing. And we must remember that the scar tissue isn't all bad. It is part of the healing. It helps knit things together. There's muscle, tendons and ligaments, and then the fascia, which is that soft tissue membrane wrapped around everything in the body, right, right down to the cells. Another part that a lot of people don't think about is underneath the ribs are our lungs and our heart, but the lungs expand and relax like a balloon, filling and emptying with air. And that elasticity or compliance, as we call it, is very important to allow ourselves to optimise how much air we're taking in with our breathing. So it can affect our breathing. And obviously the other thing is our nerves. Sometimes they get affected. The radiation or the surgery might cut into them, might cause an irritation. Sometimes they get overstretched, sometimes they get bruised. And occasionally even get a little bit kind of burnt from the radiation and that can lead to a lot of pain but most things heal which is the great thing about the body and the brain fog was the last bit i was going to mention there now i want to talk about some of these tissues that get affected so this is the best analogy i've come up with for muscles and other soft tissue so we have normal tissue which looks like or should look like a bag of uncooked spaghetti all the fibres nice and parallel to each other, able to move over each other, not stuck to each other. And when they're all in one direction, that maximises the force transmission through them so they can work to their strongest. 
However, if you have an injury or scar tissue, it tends to look like a plate of cooked spaghetti. It's a plate of cooked spaghetti here. And if, as you can see, it's all higgledy piggledy. And a lot of times, if you cook like I do, it all just sticks. So it doesn't move and glide over each other as we would like to allow for nice free movement. Then we come on to the fabulous fascia. Fascia is amazing. It continues throughout the whole body. As I said earlier, it wraps around every cell, a bit like a honeycomb. It reacts to the pressure and stretch, depending on fibre orientation. And um, it's a lot of collagen, but also a lot of elastin in it. It's also, which is very important, a liquid matrix. And that's what reduces the friction. That's like the kind of the oil between, the lubricant between it, between the muscle fibres or the tendon fibres and so on. It also adapts to chemical changes and so on. And there's a tissue memory in it. It holds tissue memories. And the, sometimes that can be from a trauma or an experience. So sometimes the emotions that go with having a breast cancer surgery can be held in the body to a degree. And as the tissues soften and loosen, sometimes they can be released, which is great. And that allows the body then to heal even more effectively. It also can store and release energy, like a kinetic energy. So we have fascia in the sole of our foot, and as it stretches, it, it creates a sort of kinetic energy, so that we can then use to push off, um, which is a, a different type of energy than to our muscle contraction energy. And it also distributes tension. And this is probably an important part of the As you can see from the middle picture, if you pull at the shoulder, you can see the change in the grid system. It can have an effect anywhere up and down that whole grid and pull it off skew and tighten it. Or if you pull at the knee, the same thing. And on the left is a picture of really fine fascia. It can be that thin, it's amazing. So the effects of a trauma or surgery, as we can see here, there's a breast cancer scar. Of it, the fluid would normally flow easily from one fascial compartment to the next. But if we have something like a surgery, and it may cause this fascia to twist and compress and warp. And probably what has an even greater effect on that is if we have reconstruction surgery, which it takes one part of the body, sometimes the abdominal muscle, the tummy, or sometimes the latissimus dorsi muscle at the back, and fix it over on itself, bring it in under the skin at the breast to create um, natural breast. But that, the fascia gets twisted and can warp. And sometimes many, many, many years later, there's a tension in the back and people can have need to keep working to keep that looser. It also can compromise um, the exchange of food and cause swelling and function may become impaired as well. So um, as I mentioned earlier, tension can be transmitted along these. So like we saw with the grid man, when you pull in one area, tension is transmitted through the system. And that often is the reason why people who get tight, they lift their arm up, they're not just tight under here or at the scar, but also right down the side, all the way down the ribs to their hip. It's the fascia, being the tension in the fascia, that's what they're feeling. So this drag or tension can obviously decrease the mobility or lack of mobility in the system. Hold on. Now, this lady has kindly given permission for me to show these videos. They, I'm hoping they'll work now, but this is the uh, before we started, when she first came in. So I would just like you to see here, she's dropping down the arm, but watch the shape of her back. Okay, here's a C shape here. Okay, and then you see also, I gotta keep moving there, the neck is tilting to the side. She's been pulled that way and this is pushing out more to the left the higher she goes with that arm. So that's a huge compensating. It's S-shaped curve on her body just to get the arm up. So the shoulder itself is moving but that special pull through the body is creating that distortion in her movement pattern. So after a few months of physio and exercise in fairness she was a very compliant patient and we also did a little bit of facial release and um, this is how she looked afterwards. Sorry there, I just moved this out of the way. So here you see it again. So I'm getting her to do the two arms together, but you see how balanced it is and what a straight line down there her spine looks now. None of that portioning or skewing, making even creating the, um, the scoliosis, which you can see here. So she doesn't have a scoliosis, but it creates one from the position the pull through the fascia there. I hope that helps to explain it.
Yes, that's a good demonstration. Now, another thing that can create tightness and tension is called cording, sometimes also known as the auxiliary web syndrome. And this is a very good picture of it. You can clearly see it here. This cord is protruding out under the in the axilla, in the armpit. And that's what it is, is a thrombosis of the lymph vessel. But it can be quite self-limiting and it's actually frequently overlooked. People tend to not pay too much attention to it, but it is important because it creates a lot of tension both up the arm and down the side and over into the breast tissue as well. Um, and it can be painful too. And a lot of people, uh, if they get it treated, you can, it actually breaks the cord and then they're much more comfortable, obviously, which makes quite a difference. Now, scholasticity, or our lubricant, as we call it. In the space between the cells, whether the cells around the space between the muscle fibres or around the tendon or the, in the skin or anywhere in the body, in the organs, there's all that space between the cells. That's where the lymph sits. But also, it is the, as we mentioned before, the matrix and the fascia, the fluid in the fascia. So if any of that fluid and sticky. It's like thick set honey, which I have a picture of here on the left, it's kind of gel like. And that accounts for why we're stiffer in the morning. Why, if we've chronic pain or dense car, scar tissue, it can, it, it's denser, so it's stickier and thicker. It can't flow as easily. And it creates then sticky and sort of jerky movement. Not ideal. What we prefer is this more runny honey type food, where when you warm up, the, one of the reasons we do warm up for exercise is to warm up the fluid and melt it into so it's more runny honey type and it's better oil then it's more like oil and it allows and enables the free gliding movement between the tissue may it might be the muscle fiber cells or between layers of fascia or a tendon where it rubs over a bone or around a joint all those things but everything is looser and better oiled and obviously can move better so that's what we're aiming for so I'm just going to mention briefly the lymph system, which I mentioned there a moment ago. The lymph drainage system is uh, looks complicated there, but essentially it's the suction system. So the arteries and veins, the arteries pump blood around the body, and when it gets down to capillary level, it pushes it out into the space between the cells. And those cells then take the oxygen, nutrients, healing products, enzymes, whatever they need out of the that the fluid with these things in it in the space between the cells and it goes into the cell and the cell also dumps its waste product into this fluid between the cells and we call that lymph so then you have the lymph vessels which act like a suction or a straw kind of sucking it up and that then gathers it all up and it transports that fluid through the lymph vessels and as they go along the lymph vessels they will go through the lymph nodes, which are like water treatment plants or filtration plants, and also part of our immune systems. So it can trigger the immune cells that fight the bacteria, the bacteria and that kind of thing. And then that's all when it's cleansed, transported right around into the terminus up here, then into the big vein that goes into the heart, and that fluid with its components is put back into the blood system to be carried around again but it's cleaner. So it, it's very effective and that's what it does. But it, generally, if you have an artery, you have a vein and then you have a lymph vessel. So what then is when the, the this is the lymph system just around the breast tissue. Here's the breast tissue here. If you see in the top left, the pink purple are obviously the muscles and that's the big muscle, which sits behind the breast tissue right on top of the ribs. You can see then in the bigger picture down here, the little, all being like things, they're the lymph nodes. And uh, they are where, as I said, as the lymph vessel passes along, it passes through those lymph nodes. And we have collections of them in parts of the body, in our neck, in our um, uh, under our armpits, in our groin, and we have loads in our abdomen as well. About half the lymph nodes in our body are in our whole abdomen gut area. So we can see then surgery to the breast very often includes something to do with the lymph system here and if that lymph system is interrupted you're at risk then of what we call lymphedema. So what is lymphedema? It happens generally post uh, cancer surgery when lymph nodes or the lymph have been removed so the lymph system is now interrupted 
I equate it a bit like your foot trail on a Friday evening. If four lanes are open, everything flows freely. If there's only two or three lanes open, then everything starts to back up. So when you take away some of the lymph nodes, sometimes it causes, like the your foot, to go down to two or three lanes. So <clears throat> there's a backup of the fluid in the system. And if that's significant enough, you start to see it. Like in this lady, her left arm has lymphedema. It's a whole lot of excess fluid backed up in the arm. Because remember, this is a cul-de-sac. When the fluid comes down here, it has to go back up again and into the body and be processed and removed. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, the good news is that now the surgical techniques have really been refined. So rather than whipping out loads of lymph nodes, they generally only take one if they're not sure if there's any uh, ones. And they do an anastomosis of the lymph nodes. Lymph, sorry, my apologies, the lymph vessels. So you're not just uh, leaving them uh, horn like closing off one lane of deerfoot forever. Um, that works much better and it really reduces the risk of lymph tumor for people. <clears throat> right, excuse me. So how does exercise help all of this? What does it do? And particularly in relation to the oncology people um, where that kind of rehab and exercising helps. What does it do? It prevents and it reduces cancer-related fatigue or effects of medication, which can include things like the constipation, the, the, quite a big one that happens with um, the chemo or with some of the hormone-type drugs afterwards as well. It also has a big effect on uh, osteoporosis, which is the condition where your bone density decreases. And normally, as for us women, as we go through menopause, we're losing estrogen anyway, and it's dipping. So that's not helping our bone density. But when we have cancer and different things like the chemo and the radiation and the surgery and all of that, um, that can also speed up the decrease of the estrogen and therefore an effect the osteoporosis, the bone density. However, the good news is that if we work hard at it, we can reverse the osteoporosis and help it. So any exercise or rehab post breast cancer surgery can do all sorts of things. It can increase our general mobility and fitness. It improves our balance. It can increase our muscle mass or muscle strength or muscle endurance. The stronger bones I mentioned, and I'll come back to that again. And it improved quality of life. Exercising has been well shown in research to help weight management, improve daily functions and activities. Remember we mentioned the ADLs like brushing your hair, tying your brass strap, reaching your toes to tie toenails, all those little things that are important that we want to be able to do ourselves. Get dressed, put on our t-shirts. Um, it can do, create a reduction in cancer-related pain and the nausea and vomiting that sometimes comes with it. It can reduce the risk of secondary lymphedema, which is the lymphedema we looked at in the slide before. And it can improve our mood and it can decrease stress and anxiety and help sleep. So it can do all sorts of things, help in all sorts of areas. I'm just going to mention briefly here that a lot of people with breast cancer surgery go on to hormone therapy of different types afterwards. And this is one of the bigger effects on um, increasing your risk of developing osteoporosis. That's the bone density condition. So <clears throat> if we strengthen our bones, we, we reduce this risk. And we do that with weight bearing or resistance type exercise and loading our bones. So strength type training. So the bones feel the force in them and that triggers them to lay down more bone. But it also helps to offset the um, issue with the decreasing estrogen. We have a lady doing her resistance exercises with a beautiful posture. <laughs> so when we're doing exercises, any idea what body structure is our best friend? So if you want to write in the chat, we can have a little look at it. But our best friend for this is muscles. Our, and we've over 640 muscles in the body. So we've loads of friends to help us with this. Muscles are just amazing. When we exercise, what they do. So we, have to, we should be falling in love with all our muscles. Obviously, they do things like they support our structure and help us to move, move that structure, to bend our bones, to, to allow us to do our all the activities that we like. It also balances the tension around the joint. So think of your knee joint, it bends and straightens, and you have your quadriceps and your thigh muscle and your hamstrings, hamstring and your back of the thigh muscle. And if they're not balanced, you get knee pain because there's an uneven tension pulling on that knee joint. 
The muscles also help with our posture and alignment, the uh, resting tension in muscles, which helps to keep us upright. We, and we, that way we win the fight against gravity. It also connects the fascia, and fascia, as we know, connects everything, it's wrapped around every cell in the body, remember, and it's nice and stretchy. Muscle holds tension, so sometimes it holds an increased tension because we're in fight or flight, we're fearful, we're in pain, we're worried, all these reasons, or simply from the healing of the, as the scar heals, the radiation, all those things that can pull the fascia and the muscles tighter in that process. The great thing about when you work your muscles, when you do exercises like strength training, resistance training, or even using your body weight, then the muscles release thousands of happy hormones, make us feel better, of enzymes, anti-inflammatory chemicals, all sorts of really positive things for our body. It is the number one thing to help us protect ourselves against aging and all of the conditions of aging as our body deteriorates, is to keep our muscles strong. So, so hope you all fall in love with your muscles. <laughs> with these muscles, what's better? Is it better to stretch or to strengthen? Well, I think at this stage, you'll probably have figured out that um, strengthening is very important. But if you just strengthen without the stretching, it's not so good. And I'll tell you a very brief story of um, treating a lady in uh, Australia years ago whose shoulder wasn't going above 90 degrees and she was complaining she couldn't play her lawn bowl anymore. So after a few sessions, thankfully, we got her her range of movement stronger again and she was back playing her lawn bowl and as she was leaving she said well that's great now because you know I wasn't winning anymore and so when I went I thought the lady was about 70 but when I went to write her discharge letter she was 94 and I thought wow if you can be that want to be that strong and that mobile and winning your lawn bowl at 94 that's pretty good so stretching is important because if you don't do the stretching you might have the strength but you don't have the age and in fairness not many of us are going to look like this lady on the right, <laughs> no matter how much stretching we do. So that's just, that's hypermobility. <laughs> okay. So the importance of stretching that maintains the length tension ratio in the muscle. A muscle is at its optimal strength at its when it's at its optimal length. If it's shortened, it can't work as well. And if it's too long and overstretched, it can't work as well. So stretching as an exercise helps to keep that balance between the length and the tension better. It also increases the fluidity and therefore improves the mobility of our body. And it can help to release the holding pattern, which we referred to briefly earlier. For instance, after having a surgery in our body, that's kind of invasive and it can be sore and painful and we can have emotions around that and they get held in there. But if we can release the muscles, that helps to release that tension and emotional trauma even as well. And it, when we're stretching, remember, a lot of times you say I'm stretching my pec muscle or my biceps muscle, but actually we're always stretching more than one muscle. It's very hard to really isolate just one muscle. We can focus on that an area, in, but we're never fully just stretching one muscle, which is great. Remember, 603 muscles, so it's a lot of muscles. <laughs> and the other thing about muscles when you stretch is it creates a self-traction of the joints, which actually creates a little more space in the joint and that allows the joint to move and not be grinding bone on bone and it also helps stimulate the, the production of the synovial fluid which is like the oil in the joint and the little movements of the, the um, muscle help soften the uh, other structures as well and it responds well to the vibration and the muscles tend to relax so here's some just as a general what kind of exercise then are good to do if you've had this cancer surgery. Generally, the golden rule is slow and gentle because the lymph system is slow and gentle. It has a rhythm, but it's about six seconds, one every six seconds. So if you think of that, it's like when we do the manual lymph drainage, which is the movement we do on the skin to stimulate the lymph, help move the fluid when you have too much fluid, but it's nice, it has a rhythm and it's slow and gentle. And that's what the body, the, the lymph system and post breast cancer surgery responds better to. So great things are yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, Pilates, and even dance. So it doesn't necessarily mean mad, phonetic, you know, rave dancing. <laughs> it could be ballroom dancing. It could be gentle waltzing. It could be two steps, they call it here, whatever. 
all that type of thing. I have a picture here of rebounding. Rebounding is when you, it's like a walking movement you do on a small trampoline. It's not bouncing up and down and doing summer, so that kind of thing. Nice and gentle. But you can do arm movements as you see this lady doing with it. And even 10, 20 minutes can make quite a significant difference. Stimulate the lymph system to work a little bit more efficiently and it strengthens and it makes um, the whole system working better. Obviously, walking is very good. Aerobic can be to a degree, but it depends what stage you're at and your, your other level of fitness and how your body responds. There's cycling, rowing, the dragon boat, I'm sure you've all heard of. Just one thing, a little word of caution, is sometimes with the dragon boats, people end up always on one side or the canoes that you use here, it's always using one side. It's better if you can keep changing one side and then do the other side to keep it more even so you don't get risk of repetitive strain and the other one is aquatherapy so we'll talk a little more about that so aquatherapy therapy working and doing exercise in the water is probably the best place to do it uh, if you have a choice so you can see these ladies doing their breathing and their squatting and they have their hands on the chest and on the tubby so they're also bringing in the abdominal breathing which we'll talk about as well in a few minutes why is water so helpful? Well, you can see on the left here the buoyancy force pushing us back up to bob like a cork on top of the water. But we have to use our strength to keep ourselves down to help strengthen us. Any movement in the water, we're pushing against the water, no matter what direction we move. So that's like a resistance, that's strength training. But it's because we're supported all around our whole body by the water, it's like it's very protective for the joints and there's less force through the joints so it's easier on them and if you see the picture here on the right this is to do what we with what we call hydrostatic pressure that's like the ideal compression garment because the deeper down the water you go i.e the ankles say relative to the hips the ankles are deeper down that means there's more water above them and the, the more weight of water which creates more force which creates more pressure on our lower limbs. And then that pressure decreases slightly as there's less water as we go up, which is the perfect compression gradient to help move the fluid. If we have, for instance, lymphedema in the leg, to move that fluid up into our abdominal area and into this system where it can be better uh, managed. So it's absolutely ideal to work with there. I've just put this in here. There's a lady in Israel called Barrett Idhar. And she's developed quite a, an effective whole aqualymphatic exercise program. But I just put this picture in because it's a lovely movement of arching the upper back. You see she's in a bit of a C shape in the back. It's a big curve. She's also pulling her shoulder blades together. So she's stretching out the front there and as she's walking. So it isn't a video, but if it was a video, you'd see that the arms then come forward in a round movement. She pulls those shoulder blades around her chest wall as she moves steps forward and then pushes the water back and repeats it. So she's bending the, the spine forward and bending it back, pulling the shoulder blades forward and back and within the water with the resistance, creating a, a lot of strength training as well. It's a really lovely exercise for women with breast post-breast cancer surgery. Breath work. A deep abdominal breath does probably a hundred or if not a thousand great things for the body. It's one of the most effective tools we have and it's one of the simplest. We can all do it. Just be sure you're doing it well. Put two hands, one on your chest and one on your tummy. And the idea is that as you breathe in, there should be much greater expansion at your tummy area. So really filling it up like a balloon. And then as you breathe out slowly, you're blowing it out and you really pull your belly button in and the whole tummy in as far as you can. And that contracts the diaphragm. So by contracting the diaphragm, you're working it's the diaphragm squeezes on a big vessel of lymph that carries three quarters of the lymph from the body up into the, the back into the heart, essentially. So that squeezing is like a, like a pump, like the heart is for the vascular system. This helps the lymph system. Also, as we contract our abdominal muscles, we're putting a bit of pressure and squeezing on all the lymph nodes in our whole abdominal area. And remember, half the lymph nodes in your body are in this abdominal area. So when we squeeze on those and trigger them, become a little bit more efficient. They work a little faster and a little bit stronger in moving the fluid through the lymph system. It also, if you breathe into your nose, we actually produce a gas in our nose that when we breathe in through the nose, we inhale it. And that has been shown to reduce 
our stress, reduce that fight or flight, bring us back down into the more what we call parasympathetic or the safe mode when we're relaxed. So simple thing like breathing into your nose while you're doing this. It also energizes us, it cleans us, it purifies us, it uplifts us, and it can help with heart rate, heart blood pressure. It can help with anxiety. It can help with stress. It can, it, it just, it, it's just amazing. There's too many things it does to list them all here, but from the lymph system point of view and from your general health point of view, deep breaths are very important. So in our clinic, we generally suggest to our patients so at least 10 belly breaths going to bed at night and 10, be 10 belly breaths when you wake up in the morning to get the lymph system going. And if you think of it during the day, even better again. OK, so just in a bit of a nutshell, some guiding principles for exercising, particularly when we're focused on people post breast cancer surgery. Start conserv conservatively, little by little, step by step. You're not going to force anything, you don't want to strain anything, but you want to gradually improve. So slow and steady and regular breaks. Remember the lymph system has, you know, it squeezes, relaxes, six seconds. Squeezes, relaxes, six seconds. So, you know, when, when this isn't about running as fast as possible or going on to spinning class. That's not the type of exercise. Slow and steady and regular breaks to give our lymph system a chance to catch up with the um, stuff that's produced from exercising and metabolizing exercise. And the lymph system is brilliant at removing that and keeping it clear, but we have to give it a chance. We don't want to overload it, and that might trigger lymphedema with the excess fluid that we're trying to avoid. So little and often is better than long sustained periods. Slowly add resistance and exertion in small increments, always testing how is your body while you're doing it? How is it immediately after? How is it that night? How is it the next day? Do you notice any change? Does your arm or leg feel any different? Is your arm heavier? Does it look more swollen? Is it more sore? All these things. So you can monitor how it is for you. Obviously, we all know this, but we forget sometimes, stay well hydrated. A good amount of water, not into excess. Six, seven litres is probably too much. <laughs> you know, three litres a day for most people is fine. If it's really hot weather, maybe a little bit more, because we will sweat out things as well. So just be mindful of that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, remember your body is unique you your stage of healing is unique to you so modify the exercises and how far you go to how it feels to you so stretching and moving should be mild comfortable not straining and sore and you know a little stretch when you feel it that's it don't force it okay and obviously slow warm-ups and cool down as we mentioned earlier that helps to melt the excess honey kind of stuff it's a nice runny honey, so it's nice and oiled and really get, everything can glide easily over each other and move easily. So therefore, we're reducing the risk of further strain or injury and that kind of thing. And obviously, stretching and things help that to reduce muscle soreness as well afterwards. So I'm just mentioning here that in October, in the Lymph Balance Centre, we're running a class specifically for women post-breast cancer. And it'll be for six weeks. Each class is 90 minutes starting on the 3rd of October. 90 minutes includes 30 minutes of a talk, forehand information talk, to educate people, and some of you have heard before, some of it will be new, but it's always good to hear because it's important. Then we do 45 minutes of exercise, and a lot of it is work with the parabands, and we finish off with 15 minutes of meditation. But it also includes a session before and a session after the six classes, so I can assess you individually as to where you're at, and then I can modify the class for you. And there's a maximum of 10 people in the class so that we can keep um, an eye on everyone and help modify each exercise for each person. Because as I said before, we're all individual. And it'll be at the South Lymph Balance Centre location. And that's it. Thank you all very much indeed. And I just put up this here to remind us all that we're all wonderful women and not to forget it, no matter what we're going through. And I'll take any questions there now and have a look in the chat. Thank you.